Hello everyone and welcome to our panel discussion which will explore how organisations can benefit from incentives to deploy EV charging infrastructure. I'm Nino Dicara, founder of Electric Autonomy Canada and I'm delighted to moderate today's discussion which is sponsored by Flow EV Charging. We created Ad Energy in 2009 with a single purpose, to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles. From the outset, we knew that developing the best charging experience was going to play a key role in that transition. We took no shortcuts and embraced all the challenges involved, from station design to software development, from network operation to manufacturing. We wanted to prove that EV charging could be simple and reliable and provide an experience where things just flow. After more than a decade in business, we continue our journey ahead, always keen to embrace new challenges. We have developed solutions for key market segments, building a comprehensive offering to better meet the needs of EV drivers. We're grateful to Flow's support in enabling this webinar to take place, and uh, thanks for that video. Well, a dramatic increase in the number of public electric vehicle charging stations in Canada is re required to support the forthcoming wave of EVs that are going to be hitting the market and the federal government's targets for zero emission vehicle adoption. So at what point should organisations such as cities, municipalities, retailers, workplaces, as well as fleet operators and other site hosts plan to install EV chargers? What are the business cases they can sh should consider and the public funding options that are available? Well, that's what we're going to be discussing today. Right, let's meet our panel. They are Ian Neville, Senior Sustainability Specialist at the City of Vancouver. Mary Quintana, Director, Asset Management and Utilities at Brock University. Cara Clareman, President and CEO at Plug and Drive. Brooke Sheehan, Sales Director at Flow EV Charging. Well, welcome to the panelists and welcome to all the audience who've, uh, who've uh, zoomed in. Um, I'd like to start by inviting uh, each panelist to introduce their roles and, and their organisation. And let's, let's take it in the order of the uh, introductions just now. So Ian, would you just like to kick us off? Sure, great. Thanks, Nino, and, and thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Ian Neville. I'm a Senior Sustainability Specialist at the City of Vancouver. Uh, I lead our, our, our policy and strategic direction with, uh, with regard to electric vehicle infrastructure in the public realm um, and sort of everything we're doing to try and advance EV adoption uh, more broadly across the city. Thanks, Ian. And Mary, over to you. Hi, I'm Mary Quintana, Director of Management and Utilities at Brock. Brock University is located in the Niagara region on a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. And my role here is to look after electricity, uh, the district energy system as well, um, some of the other assets that are flagship buildings, and sustainability is also my portfolio. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mary. And Cara? Thanks, Nino. Uh, Kara Clareman, uh, President and CEO of Plug and Drive. Uh, Plug and Drive is a nonprofit all about helping consumers make the switch. So we focus a lot of our effort on education as well as some research and policy work. And uh, very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for taking part. And uh, Brooks. Hi, thanks, Nino. Uh, Brooke Sheehan, I'm the uh, U.S. Sales Director for Flow. Um, I've been with Flow for five years and uh, helped uh, build out our Ontario and Central Canada region uh, for all things Flow EV charging. And uh, now I am uh, heading up our U.S. expansion. Awesome. Well, th thanks, Brooks, and uh, everyone for joining us. And uh, yeah, well, let's get into the uh, let's get in, get into the conversation. And Caro, if uh, perhaps you'd like to. Um, really just help us set the scene for where we are uh, right now with EV adoption and where we're likely to be sure. in, in, in the near future and what you expect sure. the demand to be around EV charges. Well, thanks. Um, look, I wish I knew exactly <laughs> if I did. I think maybe, um, uh, yeah, I'd be, uh, maybe, maybe I'd be um, in a different role. But, um, but what I can say, 
say is this. So we're, you know, Canada's doing okay with EV adoption. We're running around, you know, 4% of new car sales for and a bit. And uh, that's not bad for a small population country. The thing that is uh, interesting about Canada is our adoption is extremely uneven across the country. So, you know, we have really great numbers coming in out of BC at, you know, as much as 11 or 12%, depending on which, which, <laughs> which study you look at. And, uh, and Quebec, you know, hovering around eight or 9%. Um, and the rest of the country sort of down in the low, you know, 2% and below. And um, I think, you know, it's quite apparent that the different policy frameworks that we have in the different provinces are really making a big difference. So, you know, in Quebec and BC, where we have um, a provincial incentives that stack upon the federal incentive, you know, we see a big difference compared to the, the rest of the country. Now, um, it'll be interesting to watch because a lot of other provinces have added incentives. We're up to, I think, six provinces with provincial incentives. And so we are going to see changes there. It's early days. Um, uh, Ontario, uh, you know, it's hard to say how we'll do. Uh, we still don't have any uh, additional incentives here, although what we do have is a, a big push on manufacturing, uh, which is fantastic, but we won't see the results of that probably for two years. So for right now, I think there's a lot we need to do um, as a country if we really want to accelerate adoption across the, across the whole nation. Thanks. That's a that's a great overview. And what um, so, so obviously critical from the incentive side, um, from the infrastructure side, what what are the kind of moves that we do we need to be planning for and, and making now? Do you think sure. in terms of sure. ramping up our charging infrastructure relative to where it is now? Yeah, I mean, I think actually we're doing pretty well uh, across the country. I mean, for those of us, and I think some in this group you know, who've been driving EVs for 10 years, that the first year I had my EV in 2011, there were two, uh, two fast chargers or level three stations in all of Ontario. And they were both about a, a mile from each other in Mississauga. And so, you know, when you compare that to today with, you know, many hundreds of stations and many thousands across the country, we've actually done a lot in 10 years. And so, you know, I, I hate to, you know, of course we can do more and of course we need more, uh, but I, I, would, I wouldn't want to suggest that um, there isn't enough now for people to adopt the cars because what I hear from a lot of people is, oh, you know, I'd love to get an EV except, you know, there's not enough chargers. And I said, just take a look at the plug share or charge hub map. There actually are a lot. It's just that you don't see them because they're, you're not looking for them. And so I don't want to give the impression there isn't infrastructure, but of course we can do better. And I think one of the main thing is, of course, on the main highways, we've done a good job where we've done, you know, less good is in the more remote parts of the country, which there are many. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to see it build out, but it's, uh, it's still a bit sketchy if you want to make a very remote trip. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the overview. And uh, Ian, uh, Vancouver's leading the way with some very progressive EV policies and, and Cara highlighted some of the adoption rates in, in BC right now overall. Um, from your point of view, um, as, as, and as advice for other municipalities who, who might be listening in. Well, why is uh, public EV charging so critical for your city? Thanks, Nino. So for us, um, there's kind of an interplay between home charging and public charging. Um, we've had you know, new construction requirements for home charging for a number of years now, which I think is great for folks moving into new buildings. Um, and you know, it, it has resulted in quite a lot of infrastructure that means we, we don't need to be built on the public side. But Public charging really does fill uh, an important niche for, for all those folks who maybe can't retrofit their home or they, they live in a multifamily building that, you know, can't or won't make those those upgrades. Um, nearly two thirds of Vancouverites live in multifamily buildings, so that is a big challenge. 
Um, certainly, you know, if you if you're in a home like if you if you live in a basement suite and you don't have access to a garage, all those reasons mean that we want to have public charging and particularly DC fast charging out there to support those folks. And having that charging in places where people would go anyway, I think, is the key thing. Given that charging is not as fast as going to the gas station, there is still some pause time. It may be maybe just a few minutes, but there's definitely even a psychological aspect to that. So ensuring that your charging is put you know, at the grocery store or, or you know, if it's a level two, like, um, you know, community center or, you know, restaurant, somewhere people will be a little bit longer. But the idea is that it's convenient. You're not creating new driving trips just to charge your car. Um, and I think public charging is really important for that. There's another side to it, too. Uh, in Vancouver, uh, a lot of our framework for charging is, is now under our climate emergency action plan, uh, which wants to see 50 percent of the kilometers traveled in this pro in the city be through zero emission vehicles by 2030. What that means is that it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that half the vehicles need to be uh, electric, but there's certainly an effort to get those higher mileage vehicles shifted over. So, um, you know, the Ubers and Lyfts, the car sharing vehicles, those passenger fleets, I think are going to be really key to hitting that goal. And we need to have public charging to support them. Um, you know, obviously, if we can get a, a home charging station for every Uber driver out there, that saves us all kinds of trouble. But that's probably going to be a, a bit of a challenge, um, given that a lot of them don't live in Vancouver. Um, so again, having access to fast charging, um, you know, if you're a two-way two -way car sharing company, um, if we can find ways to dedicate charging to a given vehicle, or if we can create charging hubs for those one-way car share vehicles, all those things are really important. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Now, that the, um, the, uh, the Climate Emergency Action Plan with targeting 50% of journeys by, by 2030, I think it's just such a smart metric in terms of actually getting the higher as you say the higher mileage vehicles off the road it's a it's a, a yeah a, a, gr a great way to, to approach the the transition and and looking forward what's you know what, what's your view in terms of what's going to need to happen in terms of the number of chargers that are going to need to you know, how quickly and rapidly are we going to need some in, need to increase the number of chargers to be able to accommodate that those that kind of mileage if you like um, well, for us, I guess there's two pieces, um, you know, there's sort of an equity push on the one side for the more the general population. Um, there's a lot of underserved areas in Vancouver, uh, which don't have a lot of charging infrastructure. Um, in, in BC now, you can, people can charge money for, for electricity for using EV charging. So there is a growing market of private sector providers out there, particularly with level two. The business case for DC fast charging is still um, not amazing. Um, but what we're seeing is that the charging goes into places that, that already have kind of a strong business case. And so there are large pockets of the city that aren't well served. And so, and those tend to be, you know, lower income, higher residential, less commercial activity going on. And so one of the things we need to do is boost up a lot of numbers in those areas and making sure that, again, you know, if it's, if, if people are tenants in a home, that they have a charger near to their home. Um, in terms of the overall numbers of public charging, I like to support those other fleets. Um, you know, for, for car share vehicles, it's, it's, it's pretty much one-to-one -one in level two. Um, so for every, every um, you know, car share vehicle we want to convert to electric, we need to put in a level two charger somewhere. Um, I think in some scenarios, we can probably spread those out and, and load share them and, and do some other interesting things with the technology. That, but in terms of ports, you're looking at one-to-one. -one. Um, and then DC fast charging, by the end of next quarter, we expect that we'll have a DC fast charging hub within a 10 minute drive of anywhere in the city. Uh, we we'll probably want to look at doubling that up at least in the next five years. Um, and so that that puts us like right now, there are not including Tesla superchargers is about um, 25 or 30 DC fast chargers across the city, I think. Um, and then and then yeah, the Tesla's you know, bumped that number up a fair bit beyond that. So um, we would probably look to, to want to like double that or more um, in the next five to seven years. Right. So good. So quite some significant uh, um, infrastructure to go in. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Thank you. And M Mary, can you share why Brock University decided to invest in EV chargers and explain a little bit about the service uh, they provide for your own fleet, for the, the campus and for the community at large? Sure. Uh, for us, it was really a, an easy decision. Being in a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, we have a, a strong commitment with sustainability with, uh, with our, uh, our, our Niagara region. So we really wanted to, to spearhead something like this. Um, we also had a growing demand of, um, of our community moving towards uh, electric vehicles. So we wanted to support them by removing some of that 
range anxiety. We have people that come from Hamilton, Grimsby uh, in their electric vehicles. We really wanted to support them and make sure that they felt at ease, that they can charge here and uh, it, it, it's fine. We want to, to be part of that solution. And the Niagara region overall support the community to really help them embrace uh, more of the EV charging um, and the EV vehicles as well. We are um, close to the Highway 406. So that made us uh, a really good, good location for installing some of those. Um, so we, we, we really have um, many, many good reasons. And probably the other one would be to demonstrate leadership. We are a medium-sized uh, educational institution. So we have that flexibility um, and a more organic um, structure than some of our, uh, our, our peers in Toronto. We have a more, more leeway. So we wanted to demonstrate leadership by early ad adopting some of these technologies and being part of, uh, of the movement. That's great. And, and how would you say that that reception has been uh, so far in terms of that leadership positioning and so on? It has been very well received. Um, we have had our community, it has really spoken up and we see the chargers now operational and we see them busy uh, all the time. It has really increased the, the, the use as we're getting good feedback from, from our users. It's something that people were really looking forward to and they are appreciative now that they have come to campus after long 18 months, uh, they are happy to see those. And um, so I, I think we're, we're right on track. Oh, uh, sorry, and you had mentioned the, the fleet. So we also are transitioning our fleet uh, for personnel um, to electric vehicles. So we, we try not to, to encroach into what our community uses. We have our own in the building, but that's something that also has been very successful. In the last year and a half, we have, we have bought two more electric vehicles and it was never a question anymore about do we want electric or do we want a regular vehicle? It was, okay, which electric vehicle are we, are we purchasing? So it's something that it's good to hear from our community. Parking services, they are changing their vehicle. They said, I want an electric vehicle too. So it's, it's been very well received. Great. And, and how many uh, electric vehicles does the university have in total? You mentioned two, was it two or is that? Uh, we have three, four here in facilities management and a couple more uh, around campus from other uh, departments. Terrific. And, and uh, just to clarify uh, my understanding, so you've got separate charges that, that service the fleet versus those for uh, people attending the campus? That's right. Got it, cool, great, thanks. Um, so Flo, uh, sorry, Brooks, I know that Flo's worked with a lot of diverse organisations. Obviously, we've, um, we, you know, we've obviously got a city and uh, an academic institution here, but uh, I know that your work expands a lot, lot further than that. Um, uh, thinking more broadly about some of these other types of site hosts, such as retailers and, and workplaces, um, what do you find their motivating factors are to, to install charges? Why, why are people contacting you and why, why are they doing this? Yeah, a, a lot are contacting us just to contribute to overall sustainability, right? And be a part of the overall change, like, like Ian mentioned, uh, the 2030 change, right? A lot of people want to contribute to that, uh, whether it's lead points into their building, into their infrastructure, um, having employees be attracted to work at those locations. For retailers, I would say it, it helps, what I like to say, keep eyes on the locations, right? And what I mean by that is, Kara mentioned plug share and, and charge uh, hub apps that show the electric vehicle infrastructure throughout your communities or throughout your journey. Um, they're really attracted to that and having those chargers display on those maps and also maps in OEM vehicles like GM and Nissan appear on the dashboards to attract people to go to those locations. Um, you have to look too at how long people are sitting charging for, right? So that gets really attractive. An average person at a DC fast charger plugs in for 18 to 24 minutes typically in warmer months up to 30, 35 minutes in, in cold months. So you have a person there um, that could be purchasing other, other goods and services, going into restaurant, going into fast food, which makes it enticing and helps the business case of DCFC make more sense, right? Because you're not just looking at it from how much of the charge you're making, but how can I attract somebody to come to my property and spend more money there? Um, that's a huge contributing factor. Um, a lot of retailers like shopping malls like Level 2 and DCFC because they see people staying where an average in a mall shopping environment is about 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes. 
in level two, when they have them, they actually see people sitting for an hour and a half to three hours. So longer time periods to attract customers in is a, is a big contributing factor. Right. So, so the, the business case really is uh, uh, much more than just the amount that they can charge for the use of that exact service. It's more about really the, the traffic and foot flow and what they yeah. can do with the customer when they're on site. Yeah, if retailers are, are looking at it solely from a uh, make revenue on EV charging, they're going to struggle, whether it's level two or, or DC. Um, it, it is definitely around the, the greater environment and being creative with it. Great. Well, we're going to touch a little bit more on some of the business model aspects uh, um, in, in, in a moment. Um, so thanks for that, Brooks. Um, so in terms of uh, financing charges, there is uh, some significant public uh, funding programs that are available. And uh, one that's been running for a while now is the um, program called the Zero Emission Vehicle uh, Infrastructure Program, which is run by Natural Resources Canada, a, a department of the federal government. And um, Cara, you know, perhaps you could uh, just explain a little bit more about the ZEVIP program as it's often referred to and uh, just how it works and how people can access the funds. Sure. Sure. So a ZVIP, as we call it, Zero Emission Vehicle uh, Infrastructure Program, is, uh, as you mentioned, available through Enercan. Now, the challenge of this particular program, oh, am I frozen, Nino? You're good. I'm hearing you well. Am I okay? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, uh, I thought maybe it froze up for a sec. Um, the, the challenge of this particular program is it's not sort of an apply and you shall receive kind of program. Uh, you have to, the, the, not everyone succeeds. So it's somewhat what I would say it's a competitive program. So uh, you need to have something a little bit unique usually in your application to be successful. But if you are successful, um, they do fund up to 50% uh, of the infrastructure and it can be for a large block of chargers, not, not just one or two, it can be, it can be I think glad the last round, they're, they're gonna do a new round and we don't know what the rules will be, but. The, the past round, there was up to 20 uh, level twos and uh, two uh, DC fast chargers. And so it was quite substantial. And uh, we we're told that there'll be a new round and the, and the new rounds have been focusing also on multi-unit as Ian mentioned, that's a real challenge. Um, so multi-unit residential, which is more level two and, uh, and commercial. So it's not just for public charging at, you know, on route on, on, you know, um, highway stops. It, it can be for um, home charging in multi-unit residential. And so the same would, would apply for a, a workplace uh, potentially as well, where the charges are being deployed for- That's right, an, also an workplace, work, yes. Uh, it, Right. Some of the money did go towards workplace charging as well. Um, so that can be for both a fleet and for uh, employees. So it gives you some options there in terms of in terms of what you apply for. I know that Plug and Drive's done some done some uh, advisory work for for workplace. Uh... Uh, pe people thinking of workplace charging. Yeah, yeah, we have a great uh, guide available that's generic in terms of, you know, it just goes through all the questions that so many people have asked us in terms of, you know, things to consider when you're thinking about workplace charging. So everything from like, you know, how many and should I have a payment system and how do I know how many people might do it and, you know, all the kind of questions that we seem to get over and over. Cool. Thanks, Cara. Um, and, and just a reminder for uh, the audience to, if you have questions for the panelists, please do feel free to put them into the, directly into the Q&A and then uh, we'll, we'll be uh, um, aiming to get as many of those as we can uh, to the questions at the end. Um, and so Ian, just, just for referencing oh, and the- the only other thing, Nino. Yeah. Sorry, go, go just one more thing, Nino, that I noticed and you, you reported on it that, um, that uh, some of the candidates for the Ontario election have already 
indicated uh, that they would top up that Anarchan funding with provincial money uh, should they be successful. So, so that's, that's good to know. So uh, something to look out for in the Ontario election uh, as it takes place next year. Um, thanks, Cara. Um, yeah, so, uh, um, it, so, so Ian, it would be great to just to get, get um, having just speaking perhaps a little bit more depth uh, regarding the federal program, the Zevit program that Cara was just uh, explaining. Um, I know the city of Vancouver has been successful in, in some of these uh, funding applications. And I wonder if you could share some of the examples of some of the projects that you've rolled out uh, under Zevit and and perhaps also, if I can ask you a two-pronged question, um, to, to maybe at the end chat about some of the provincial uh, incentives that you've also been, been able to apply for through Clean BC, for example. Sure. Um, so, yeah, we have been successful twice uh, to the 2018 and 2019 uh, ZEVIP uh, applications. Um, the first round was strictly for deploying DC fast charging, um, and we were lucky enough to get um, six new DC fast chargers around the city, which was great because I think at the time we only had two. So that, uh, that tri tripling or quadrupling our network was, uh, was definitely a good thing. Um, and then the second round, we, we applied again for public charging, um, but this time it was a mix of, of both DC fast charging and uh, level two. Um, so in this new case, which we're just finishing implementing now, we're looking at uh, DC fast chargers in some kind of key corridor or like hub charging locations, and then level two charging that we're deploying um, at a number of our community centers around the city. Again, part of that sort of filling out the network and sort of plugging holes, if you will, in, in the network, um, finding some of those community centers, which are, I think, really ideal locations for level two, given that the, the dwelling time tends to be about two or three hours, which as Brooks noted, that's a that's you know a good, good level two charging time. Um, so both of those have been excellent for us. Um, and then, yeah, with the Clean BC, uh, that, that just allowed us to top up. So as folks may or may not know, uh, if you're applying to Anarchan, it's like a matched funding kind of thing. Like they're covering only half of your project cost uh, in most cases up to, up to a limit. So, you know, for local governments, uh, not, not every um, municipal government necessarily has a large capital budget for EV charging the way that, the way that Vancouver does. Um, and so coming to the table to pay for half of that you know, you're a little bit more limited in what you can apply for um, on top of the, the staff resources to actually do the application. Um, so having access to the Clean BC provincial top up has meant that we've, we've been able to make those, our contribution go quite a lot further. Um, we've, we've been able to add in a fair bit more charging and, um, and possibly deploy charging outside of those grants because we had, we had budget left over that was covered by the provincial numbers. So um, yeah, it's been immensely helpful to us. And in, in, as you've got so many, I'm sure, competing demands for, for charging. Um, how do you decide which programs you're going to uh, use to uh, apply for funding? Like, so what's your criteria for, right, this is a good project to apply for funding for? Um, well, generally, we, we try and have a, like, we generally have a list of sites we'd like to approach in the first place. And so, um, you know, we'll see if there are ones that match a given program that's out there. I know early uh, versions of Ziva really looked at having fast charging like along highway corridors. Um, and Vancouver, uh, we're very lucky in that we don't have freeways going through the city, uh, but that does make it a little bit more challenging. However, we do have a few streets that are sort of classified as provincial highways. Um, and so, you know, finding projects that we were planning on doing anyway, uh, that were maybe near to or, or on those, those corridors was really helpful. Um, certainly we look at staff resources. Um, some applications are, are very time intensive and, and we only have so many people on a team. Um, so far we haven't had too many we've had to turn down other than, you know, the, again, the project criteria didn't necessarily, um, just, when I say turn down, I mean, not apply for, it. I don't think we've ever turned down money. Um, uh, but the, uh, yeah, we haven't had any that we haven't necessarily had to, to avoid applying for, uh, unless they were just completely outside of what we were trying to to do with our program, um, I would say that, and that's been fairly rare. Um, one thing I will note, actually, there have been a couple of Anarchan grants that have allowed for like third parties to act as um, like maybe an aggregator for funds. And we've looked at those and they're a bit more challenging for, for us as a city because we're not really allowed to give money away unless you're a nonprofit or an academic institution. We can't really give out grants. And so for us to act as a funding agency is very challenging. So that's one area that we have stayed away from because it hasn't really fit with what we're allowed to do legally. 
Great. Well, th thanks for sharing that. And um, we, we, we'll, we'll chat a little bit more about some regional incentives in a minute, if I can just invite Brooks in. But um, I, just for those uh, who, who are on the um, who are enjoying the discussion and aren't watching the chat, I would just like to share a, a comment from uh, Louise Tanky from NRCAN, who's just inviting the audience. Uh, if you would like an invitation to apply to our next RF plea, please send us your contact information at taf-tcr at nrcan rn uh, can dot gc dot ca so uh, you, you can find that email address more accurately in the uh, in the in the chat column here and um, also Louisa shared a link to the to the relevant page so I uh, just encourage you audience to to check that out um, so Brooks yeah just on the regional incentives uh, side there's a number of programs available across Canada and Cara touched on a few of those from a, a vehicle uh, point of view um, but it'd be great if you could just highlight any other uh, pr provincial programs of note and and also again another two-prong question um how flow can support applications from some smaller organizations who might not be able to qualify for the minimum uh size or yeah. scale of project required yeah and, and i think that's what's exciting with the Enercan funding that's coming out now um and that's that's out so ian mentioned about the delivery agent program. So Kara spoke um, well about the Enercan uh, program for the Zevit side of things, which is typically 20 level twos or above, and then a number of DC fast chargers. That's That makes it kind of hard for smaller organizations or rural in, uh, organizations, rural communities to apply for that fund because the 20 is kind of a hard threshold to get to. Um, the programs have been great in what's been deployed. You have to keep in mind, Enercan is a small team, right? That are that are managing these funds. So what they've done is created a number of delivery organizations that are typically non-for-profits. Some utilities are participating as well that can now extend funding uh, locally um, to organizations looking for one charger, two chargers, three chargers, 20 chargers, up to 20. So it becomes a lot easier to actually apply now for those smaller organizations that have been waiting for something, maybe, for example, in Ontario. Ontario really hasn't had a provincial fund since about 2017, 2018, right? So there's a lot of Ontario firms waiting for those delivery organizations. Um, last I've heard, delivery organizations are gearing up to start marketing their program starting basically in January. Um, so be on the lookout uh, for those. But then there's also other provincial uh, funding methods. Ian, Ian mentioned one as well in NBC that can actually stack um, for DCFC, for example. So you get $50,000 from Enercan, $25,000 from the provincial fund to take advantage of helping to offset that installation cost or hardware cost further. And a lot of prov provinces are kind of following that lead um, and more will adopt it. So you're best to really kind of look at the the Enercan side of things, because a lot of times Enercan will list which other funds can be piggybacked and added on top of theirs, and then go directly locally as well. And our, our local teams can help with, with all of that as well. Great. And do you have a sense of other um, provinces that are offering similar um, initiatives? There are some stuff in the in the Maritimes. Um, there are some others coming down in, in the prairies as well. So 2022, 2023 are going to be exciting years for, I would say, programs coming. Yeah. Excellent. That's great. And and I can see just another comment in the chat just for all the audience. Uh, JM uh, Torrell um, has highlighted that for organisations and in indigenous, indigenous communities in BC, there's also the Clean BC Go Electric program that is managed here at Plugin BC uh, that has uh, successfully approved nearly 30 sites across the province. And, um, and, and there's a link here uh, as well for that people can find. So I just wanted to share that. Um, okay, so um, Mary, it would be good to um, understand a little bit about Brock's uh, process in in terms of applying for, for Zebit funding, because obviously you've been uh, successful in this regard in, in previous rounds. Um, could you share what the application process was like? Is Obviously, there's always well, there's often a lot of work involved in these kind of things. And um, and also what it meant for you to work with a company like Flow that was able to support you with that application process. It was um, an internal effort. Um, it was led by one of our project managers, 
also our energy manager himself and the manager of electrical services here at Brock. So it was a, a joint effort really. And I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, why it was successful. It had buy-in from different areas, but we found we did have that gap. We, we had some uh, chargers already, but it was a larger scale. It was, it was different to what we had done before. And that's really what Flow did for us. They educated us as customers uh, to what other alternatives were there, what we may want, what our requirements were. They really guided us through the process of determining what we needed. Um, these applications, they are not easy. They do require thought and planning and a good costing and analysis. It's That said, it's not unlike other applications that we have applied for um, federal and provincial um, as well, but it does take some knowledge so that you can then submit something that's actually robust, that has a good chance of success. And that's uh, where, where we saw the partnership between our internal stakeholders and flow to really have something that we could work towards, to have decent timelines, to have a good idea of what we were trying to achieve, what was actually achievable, and, and to understand more about what we were getting ourselves into. I think that was a major uh, thing because when we approached our senior leaders and we, we told them we, we need 50% uh, more because if we are successful, we would be needing to put in 50% of the, of the capital. So explaining to them, having that base knowledge that we had been provided before, that was really crucial in making sure that they would support this uh, initiative with confidence, like, oh, okay, so you, you know uh, the process, you have really thought this through, there you go. Those are the resources, go ahead and uh, looking forward to it. We even had some of our board members speak about how now they are going to be charging here on campus because they have an electric vehicle. So it was a very positive experience. And again, it's not more or, or less work than what we have seen for other projects, CIF, um, cap and trade. So it's not really something that I would say people should be scared of. It does require planning, but any project does. So uh, that's what I would what I would say. Great, thanks, thanks very much, Mary. It's good to hear about how you really got your internal stakeholders aligned in the in the in the process as well as obviously. And focusing externally, um, well, let's let's take that point on a little bit further about the the business model and uh, in in uh, in terms of how to make the financial justification for um, for deploying charges. I, I, Ian, could you talk a, a little about the uh, low carbon fuel standard credit and uh, how the, the city uses these to actually uh, help offset the costs? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, so for folks who aren't familiar with the BC low carbon fuel. Uh, regulation. It's basically a regulation to um, require fuel providers, more traditional fuel providers, to reduce the carbon intensity of their fuels uh, over time. Um, and generally, what this has meant is that uh, it's created a credit market for EV char or for any kind of low carbon fuel, but electricity counts as a transportation fuel in that context. And so, if you are a provider of electricity for EV charging, you can trade into this market. Um, and right now, it is in BC, it's a seller's market. Um, I think a lot of the oil and gas industry is quite anxious to, to find ways to buy credits. Um, and what that means is as a, as a provider of EV charging, um, you know, you're looking at credit values that are significantly higher than the cost of electricity. Um, and so you can find ways to get a good return on your investment. Um, for us, certainly for level two, it, it makes the return on maybe more marginally used locations quite a bit faster. Um, it, it makes the, the return on, on DC fast charging um, a little better. It still tends to be a little bit on the negative side, depending on the utilization, but much closer to actually um, a break even or a positive business case, depending on how it's used. Um, and it also allows us to, to generate credits for maybe other innovative programs. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier about trying to encourage car sharing to, to get into EVs, if we can find ways to support them through infrastructure, and maybe you know, we can ease up on our operating costs and, and really not have to download, you know, all the additional network fees and other operating costs of EV charging to the car sharing providers. If we can have that covered um, by claiming low carbon fuel credits, that really has helped us bring in some more innovative uh, programs um, and deploy more infrastructure. So I think it really does help to level the playing field um, in, in terms of providing public infrastructure, especially if they're not very high utilization locations, which tends to be when they're first going in, um, you know, as, as adoption goes up and as people find the stations, it tends to get pretty good. Certainly our downtown locations, I think, have a pretty solid business case on their own, um, but 
so many other parts of the city. And again, as I mentioned, those areas that maybe are more marginal from a business case, we can more easily justify it and then, and then have more equitable distribution of the, of the network. Right, thanks, Ian, that's, that's really helpful. And um, Cara, beyond the financial equations, can you elaborate on some of the other benefits uh, for workplaces and retailers of, of installing EV chargers? Flo touched on a few of them uh, previously, but you know, we'd love to know sure. what you're hearing from your sure. experience. Yeah, I think, um, I think a few have been mentioned, but of course, um, <clears throat> more and more uh, employees want to work for a company that they think is uh, caring about the environment and putting in chargers is one way to show that the company is thinking about these things. Um, and just even one step further, they want to help their employees uh, live more sustainably. So by offering charging, I mean, you know, in the past, maybe it was wellness programs or things uh, related to health that were, companies were sort of almost, it was almost uh, table stakes to do for for employees, you know, in terms of um, benefits. Now, uh, there's a lot more focus on environmental benefits that you can offer to your employees. So EV charging is one. Um, and of course, you can make the business case for the charging stations a little more robust if you combine, let's say, fleet and employees to sort of justify because you, like a lot of times it's hard to justify for employees especially if you don't have a good sense of how many employees will do it but if you already have some fleet vehicles you know that the, those stations will get some usage and then you can uh, perhaps have the fleet using them at night whereas you have the the uh, employees using them during the day for example so so that's another way another sort of multi-benefit um, and then finally, I would just say you might think about, um, I know we're, you know, still a lot of us working from home and still zooming like we're doing right now. Uh, but it is actually a really good time to look at putting in uh, charging infrastructure because there aren't a lot of people around. And so it might be the best time when the parking lot isn't so busy uh, to think about uh, doing your planning and installation during this time. Thanks, Cara. And Mary, as, as, a, as somebody who's actually gone through the process of installing them, would you like to elaborate on uh, Cara's comments at all in terms of the benefits that you're experiencing at Brock? Absolutely. Uh, we have um, noticed how it triggered the development of new partnerships. I, I think that's one of the bigger ones. We started conversations with Sheridan College, with the town of Oakville, who are also installing more and more of uh, EV charging stations, also the Asive. So we started conversations about how, how we can connect what they are doing to what we're doing and people commuting between our cities. So that was something that was an unexpected benefit, just start conversations with other uh, broader public sector uh, institutions and how we can collaborate. Also, we became closer to some of the departments at Brock. We, we were typically just parking services are on their own, facilities management. So we really became more, much of a tighter group. And I think that's one of the biggest advantages because now we are, we're more engaged. We're really being more effective. And that's something that we, we hope to translate into other projects and initiatives as well. The um, installation and um, operation of AB Charter really it facilitates the expansion so the next time around when we start to see that there's a, a growing need and more adoption we will be far more confident so that knowledge portion of it it's something intangible but we know that now our project managers our electrical team they are more confident and more comfortable around them so we have that knowledge um, that we acquired and finally but not least though um, opportunities for research now we're starting to think well we have been hearing about um, vehicle to grid charging. So maybe we need to get us one of those units and start playing with it or looking into those. So it really it's opening the door to more research, to more uh, opportunities that will create a, uh, the campus become um, a living lab itself. Terrific, thanks Mary. Um, and uh, just, just before we move it, we've got a whole bunch of questions. So we're gonna be getting to those very, very shortly. And uh, just before we do, Brooks, could, could you, um, just share, give us a sense of timelines and um, as, as, been, as has already been discussed, you know, a new Zevit program is, 
is, uh, is, is, is on its way. Um, so for anyone of thinking who's applying for this funding, how, at what stage of their thinking should they, should they start applying and, and if they want to tap into flow support, how quickly should they contact you about that and what should they have organized before they do? I would say the earlier the better to, to contact. Um, the nice thing about the Enercan program is um, Enercan reviews every application in detail. Uh, like Kara said, it's not a first come first serve. It's it's a very fair process. Um, but the more information that you have and the more um, uh, storyline you have in your application, the better um, to help them understand what they're what they're approving and does it meet the goals of the actual program. So the earlier you can reach out, the better. Um, part of the best thing to do um, in the overall exploration is is um, get quotes from contractors from EV charging players um, and have some idea from a financial timeline on what you're going to have to contribute because in most cases you have to contribute maybe 50 percent or 80 percent depending on the fund that you're actually applying to so it will give you some kind of idea like mary said she had to educate some of her internal teams right on the overall financial budget that is usually what i find takes the longest period of time in an organization when they're applying because you have to educate the cfo and and who's who's actually going to outfit the cost right so the earlier you do that, the better. So reaching out to organizations like us, um, ASAP is, is key. Enercan does typically post their roadmap timeline on when new funding is going to be released and what the programs are going to be. And typically within like a 95%, 98% accuracy rate, they, they piggyback from the same type of applications as what was used before. So you can do a lot of preparation before they even release the fund to, to be ahead of the game. Actually, you know, maybe if I could just jump in on that, because I think Brooks raised a really good point that, that um, I think Mary's getting at as well for government, local governments, a lot of the time, you may even need to go to your city council in order to get funds if you don't have it in your budget. And often that's not a quick process to get on a council agenda and go through those. So again, having that plan in advance, as Brooks mentioned, um, really does help get the application process to go through because there's often extra hoops to jump through um, at the government level. Great, thanks very much, Ian. Um, okay, great, well, we, we'll, we'll um, uh, kick off with some of the audience questions and I'm just going to pile straight in and just open this one up to anyone in the audience. Um, what challenges have you experienced with local electrical contractors who leads the installations of the hardware? And uh, Brooks, you touched on this in your, in, your, in your comments just now. So I don't know if you'd like to touch on that and any other panelists. I think early on what I, what I found was a lot of electrical contractors were charging more than what they should be. Um, because they were, they, they knew how much funding was coming. Um, so that was in the early days, like the 2017 eras, 2018 eras. Um, it's always good to get a couple of quotes, right? Um, in many cases, it can be far cheaper to use the on-site electrical contractor that takes care of that building to help you push out that money, right? And extend that 50% or 80% funding coverage. So doing that due diligence is, is really, really key. Great, thanks, Brooks. Um, after installing chargers, are there any metrics that we should be tracking to report on or to assist us in future business cases? And it would just be good maybe to start with uh, Mary and Ian just to see uh, how you're monitoring them uh, right now, what metrics you might be using or, or, or not. We are using the, we're counting the individual number of users in the stations. Uh, right now we are, for example, at 43, and they are unique um, users. It doesn't say how often they would be using, but we're tracking that, uh, that number. So we used to have much less than that. So we have certainly seen that the increase now that we have the information. Um, and that has been one of the, the biggest metrics so far. And so that's really interesting, Mary, because for us, we don't typically track individual unique users. We might look at like numbers of sessions on kind of an ad hoc basis, but the two primary metrics that we look at um, are our utilization overall, like how, how full is it during the day? Um, and then also um, the energy that we're actually dispensing. And so uh, the first one is because we set our user fees on, on kind of a sliding scale 
Uh, we treat our charging stations a lot of times like parking meters. And so high use stations, we tend to raise the price to encourage turnover to make sure that people aren't sitting on them. And so we wanna see kind of utilization within a given band. Um, and similarly, if it's really low, we will drop the price as well because we are trying to be as competitive as possible with fossil fuels. Um, and then the, the energy usage is primarily just um, for, again, for that low carbon fuel standard accounting um, that we do annually to, to claim those credits. Thanks. I don't know if Brooks or Cara have anything to add on uh, metrics once they're in. Yeah, actually, I, I had a thought, um, Nino. I was just thinking that one of the things that we've learned uh, just from some of the workplaces that we've spoken to who've who've put in charging and they'll often do, you know, employee satisfaction surveys and try to understand, uh, you know, how it's being used and, and how people feel about it. And what they learned was that one of the big things of putting in chargers actually just encouraged a lot more people to get an EV, <laughs> which, um, you know, you sort of, they go into it thinking we'll be catering to the people who have one or already thinking about it, but they didn't realize that actually just putting that in actually encouraged a lot of people who were on the fence. And a recent study said something like, uh, you know, for each person that's already there, it encourages six more people uh, just through word of mouth and talking about the stations and talking with their colleagues. So that's uh, pretty impressive and, and uh, pretty important in this time when we're trying to encourage more and more people to make the switch. Thanks, Cara. And, and Brooks, I've, I know of, uh, um, in some retail scenarios, they're actually looking at the impact on footfall and traffic of uh, um, uh, when, when, when they introduce their EV charges into certain locations. I don't know if you've got some direct experience of, uh, of that. Sorry, Nina, what, what was that, the, the which traffic? Uh, some, some retailers actually looking at the impact on sales or uh, oh, yeah. EV charges. So I don't know if there's uh, anything you'd like to elaborate on that. Uh, we So the flow network, we touch about 80% of EV drivers across Canada. Um, so we have different metrics that we can say to a site host, for example, hey, it's time or it's becoming time to add more stations based on usage and based on where we see members coming from. Um, uh, not in a not in a direct this individual like Nino visited your location, but we can say, hey, there were these many people. It's now time to expand based on our on our knowledge and cascading environment across our, our 55,000 stations that are deployed on the ground. So we have different metrics for that. Um, there are a lot of retailers. There's a lot of questions going around about uh, petroleum companies, right? Um, uh, Petro Canada. Uh, Co-op is getting involved. Canadian Tire has been involved with us since about 2017, and they do see increases in in foot traffic and in spending at the locations. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, another question from the audience: that smaller smaller towns and, and First Nations uh, don't necessarily have the funds to install chargers or, or or as many resources to access the knowledge and understanding about them. Um, that can hinder long distance travel. Um, how best to uh, educate these areas or to, to get into the trend? Um, I, I guess there's a broader, I mean, so I think it's broader than education because obviously there's also a funding point there, but I'd be really interested to hear what the panelists, uh, uh, what, what solutions the panelists can identify there. Yeah, Nino, I'll, I'll jump in there. Actually, I was just chatting with a fellow at a place called uh, Indigenous Clean Energy, ICE. And they actually were one of the recipients of the um, third party Enercan funding to help distribute uh, to specifically indigenous communities. So if uh, somebody uh, on, the, on this uh, webinar is interested, um, they, sh they can contact me or reach out to ICE, Indigenous Clean Energy. They are gonna be soon launching their program to offer um, charging stations specifically to more remote and rural indigenous communities. That's awesome, sounds fantastic. I, I don't know if anyone else has a, has a comment to add there. Okay, um, so uh, the uh, a comparison with Norway here, um, you know, as, as many people I know on the panel know, obviously a world leader in EV adoption, uh, a similar climate to ours in many ways. Um, are there lessons we can learn from Oslo regarding charger to EV ratio levels, uh, charging ease of use and standards? And I 
um, so yeah, does, uh, would anybody like to comment on anything that they regard as best practice, which we don't currently have here that we could do with? Um, I could jump in with a couple of thoughts. Um, certainly, you know, it's it's always a challenge to compare to European cities because one of the things that they do have going for them are, are different utility voltages, which, you know, is, is fairly technical, but it's actually quite a lot easier to, to drop a level two station on the curbside um, if you're in a European city because it's already running at 220, which means you don't need to have a separate transformer. There's simply less space taken up in the streetscape and, and less cost and, and time to do those projects. And so, um, you know, I know, for example, Amsterdam is one where they will often just, you know, they know a street needs some chargers. Maybe they've had a request from a resident and they'll just go in and put chargers down the whole street. And that becomes a much more challenging prospect when you're dealing with higher utility voltages and charging stations that don't necessarily speak to that. So that's, that's one piece. Um, also, you know, the, the, they have a couple of other things. One technical thing that I quite like is that they have removable cables for their lower power charging stations in Europe, which means, again, it's less obtrusive in your streetscape. Um, it's much easier to, to just put a box there and you know that the driver is going to have the cable in their trunk and they can plug in. Um, but then also, finally, a lot of European cities do own the land, um, a lot more of the land, um, and they have a lot of different sort of legal powers. But overall, I, I think that you know, one of the things that they do benefit from is just a big push on public charging. Um, there's a lot less new development in, in a lot of Northern European cities. And so they don't rely necessarily on home construction requirements. And so they've really pushed on getting lots of lots and lots of level two out there in particular. Um, and I think that that's obviously been very helpful. And then, you know, high taxes on fossil fuels is also really helpful. Great stuff. Thanks, Ian. No, lots of lots of great, great points there. Um, uh, somewhat topical, um, particularly from a BC point of view, are we looking at an emergency charge requirements, for example, floods, fire, electrical failures caused by storms, for instance, and so a point on resiliency, um, how do we address that with, with charges? Very timely question, uh, given that we are in the midst of uh, fuel rationing here, and so the only people who really have much assurance of getting their vehicle fueled are the EV drivers right now. Um, we don't have any specific requirements around that, although as a city we're starting to think about it. Um, you know, we just bought our first electric fire truck, um, and so we certainly need to, you know, think about that. I think that there is potential. You know, as battery storage gets cheaper, you can have those those um, you know sort of standalone storage um, situations. Generally speaking, our utility grid, or sorry, our gas, no, let's try that one more time. Our electrical grid is a little bit more resilient than, than for example, an oil pipeline. So in many ways, um, I think that just being electric is more resilient. Um, you know, BC Hydro is very much set up to do rapid response repairs. You don't tend to see long outages in, in a given area um, for that. So I think that, and, and it's a broader network because it's, you know, redundant substations and so forth, as opposed to having you know, one pipeline that feeds the area. So I, I think that overall um, we're in a good position, but it is something we're starting to think about now as, as we move into sort of broader emergency fleets being electrified. Terrific. Well, thanks very much for, for that answer. And uh, we, we really have crashed out of time. So I want to say big thanks to the audience for all your questions. I'm really sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them. Uh, massive thanks to our panellists, Cara, Mary, Ian and, and Brooks, um, for just being so knowledgeable and bringing great expertise to this discussion. And uh, I would like to also just give a big thank you once again to Flow EV Charging for sponsoring uh, this discussion and making this webinar possible today. We will be sharing a link to the recording of this webinar in the next few days on electricalautonomy.ca. And this concludes our the, uh, uh, Electrical Autonomy's full series of webinar panel discussions on the development of uh, EV charging infrastructure. You, you can find recordings and summaries of the previous discussions online at electricalautonomy.ca. Uh, uh, so thanks very much for joining us everybody and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>